First, just let me say thank you for uh, giving uh, a Wednesday night to come out and study together. I do appreciate that, and I know it's a busy world, a lot of places you could be tonight, but you chose to be here, and I will not waste your time. I will uh, do my best to make sure that your investment of one hour will be will give you good returns. And I want to say again, just because I've already had a couple of people ask me, it, this is the Hebrews Bible study. If you wanted one or the other, there are many options this time. If you wanted one of the other ones, you are in the wrong room. And that would be a good time to leave. They're all, all the other classes are in the adult education building uh, upstairs. And uh, we're not, this is only the Hebrews Bible study. Everything else is in the adult education building. There are four books in the Bible that have radically transformed my life. I don't know why. I can't explain that other than, than, than they have. They are the Gospel of John, the Book of Romans, the Book of Revelation, and the Book of Hebrews. And it's because there was an illumination in my own heart that I, I could see things after studying those books that I'd never seen before. Gave me the ability to read the Bible in a way I'd never seen before. Uh, kind of an enlightenment thing. Uh, one of those moments. And you're going to see one of those tonight. Uh, I hope you can see one of those tonight. So I'm going to pray. We're going we're gonna to dive in. Father, I just thank you for tonight the privilege of being able to study your word. And we believe that it is indeed your word. And I pray, Lord, as we start these 12 weeks, that your Holy Spirit would guide us, open our minds to understand the Scriptures, so that we might know you, the one true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. So, Father, I ask for your Holy Spirit to guide our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, our motives, until they find you. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know the book of Hebrews is the second most prophetic book? I said prophetic book in the New Testament, only behind Revelation. Now, some of you might be surprised by that beginning. It is prophetic in nature. While Revelation focuses on the future, Hebrews looks at the past predictions now fulfilled in Christ. In fact, let me tell you, Hebrews is one of the greatest tools in the Bible to prove that Jesus is who he says he is. Because you take the Old Testament and says all these things are going to happen, and it says it thousands of years ago, and then thousands of years later, the book of Hebrews announces how they all did happen, and they all happened through a single person. So it's prophetic in nature that it already fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, but it's also prophetic in nature that it will reveal future events even for us today. That's why it's such a great teaching tool, and I wonder if that's why it's kind of one of those light bulb moments as well the writer of hebrews addresses the predictions that lead up to the first coming of christ and mentions our lord's deity that he is god in the flesh his sovereignty that it, everything is his everything is his we're going to touch on that tonight and the prophetic scriptures of the old testament are are revealed in the book of hebrews no one can say for sure who wrote Hebrews. So if you think you know, you're guessing. Some people think it's Paul. When I get toward the end of Hebrews, it looks like Paul's writing. Some people think it's Apollos, but he doesn't actually tell us, so we're not sure. We can only say that we believe it is ultimately inspired by the Holy Spirit, and thus we give it respect as the Word of God. We believe it is canonized, which means it is attached to Scripture, along with the other 65 books we call the Bible. When was it written and to whom? It must have been written before 70 A.D. Why? Because it looks like the temple worship still seems to be active as the writer is writing it. And the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., so it probably has to be a little ahead of that, maybe in the mid-60s A.D., the letter is to believers in Christ, but primarily, guess what? Why you think it's called the book of Hebrews? Primarily, it's written to the Hebrews, who are the Jewish people. Today, we would call those people, and I want you to make sure you understand that. Today, we would call those people 
that Hebrews was written to Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews. They're Jewish, but they believe the Messiah is Jesus, that he's already come. If you were to sum up the book of Hebrews, you might say that the writer makes it clear that Jesus is the final and only answer to man's problem of sin. What are we going to do with sin? And this truth requires an uncompromising faith. And the standard of faith is Abraham. Don't let somebody else tell you what the standard of faith is. So if you want somebody to define what faith is, don't let the world tell you what faith is. The, the, the world will tell you that faith is believing that God exists. That's not faith. I'm sorry, that's not it. The, the definition of faith is defined by the man of faith, Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. There you go, there's your standard. He believed God and his belief led him to obey God and to follow God. The outline of Hebrews, I'm not going to go through it. I listed kind of the segments because it kind of changes gears several times in the book. So what I want to start with tonight is chapter 1, verse 1. And the title that I've kind of given it is Jesus is superior to the prophets and he is superior to the angels. Now, I doubt there's anybody in the room tonight that struggles with that. But some do. Some struggle with where does Jesus fit in the heavenly realm? Is he an angel that got a promotion? Some people think he is. Well, this is addressed in Hebrews 1. Here we go. 1-1. One, one. Long ago, in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> no, that's the wrong book. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. These are Jews, right? right? So think of the Old Testament. God spoke many ways, many times to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, you know what he's announcing? That we're in the last chapter of mankind. In these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything. Notice the word everything. In all translations, this is clear. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the Son, God the Father, through the Son, what did He do? He created the universe. Don't miss that. The Son radiates God's own glory. And the Son expresses the very character of God. And the Son sustains everything by the mighty power of his command, his voice, his will, his purpose. When he, Jesus, the Son, had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down where? In the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. His name in Hebrew would be Yeshua. We translate that word Jesus. Same word, same name. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, along with the Gospel of John, do something in its beginning. They declare the deity of Jesus Christ. And what that word simply means is this. He is God. Now, our human mind cannot comprehend much of what's about to follow. How can he be God and God be God? But Hebrews declares, along with John, the deity of Christ, they refer to Jesus as the creator. Right? You just, I just read it. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. John says he is God in the flesh, right? So how can he be different and yet he's the same? Hebrews declares that Jesus sustains all things by his wonderful word. So right now, I want you to visualize something. Right now, the planets are in order. We're all rotating around the sun. There's a, there's a, the earth is spinning as it's going around the sun, and you and I are riding this big ball through the, through the space, 
and all of it is right now, right now, this second, sustained in order by Jesus Christ. If he pulls back, if he pulls away, it all crashes upon itself. You're breathing right now because he sustains your life. Right now, this second, I'm breathing, I'm speaking, I'm thinking, I'm reasoning because he sustains my life right now. He's not just the creator, he is the sustainer. And he is the one who will close when everything is over. Hebrews also declares that even though he is God, he also sits at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, having supremacy over everything, except the only thing he doesn't have supremacy over, guess what, is the Father himself. Compare the beginning of Hebrews to the beginning of the Gospel of John. Because if we're going to study the book, I want you to notice the parallel between John's writing about Jesus and the Hebrews' writer about Jesus. Let's go to, we just read Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Let's read John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, what would that be? In the, in the Jewish world, in the beginning would be what? You'll never understand John 1 until you get that. In the beginning. The beginning of what? The creation. In the beginning of the creation. By the way, I mentioned Sunday to the Jewish people. That was 5,779 years ago. When God created and he gave life to Adam in the beginning. So I want you to, in your mind right now, realize when John's writing this under the Holy Spirit, he's talking about in the beginning when God created. Who's there? Who's doing it? What are they doing? How did this all start? In the beginning, what, what is it? The Word. In the beginning, the Word already existed. Huh. Is it a book? Is it a person? Is it a thing? In the beginning, at creation, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. So here we are. They're separate. It was with God, but it's unique to God. It was with God, and the Word was God. He was with. Now he says he. Now he's a person. He's not a thing. He's it at creation, before creation, with the God of creation. And he is God. And he existed in the beginning with God. God, the Father, created everything through him. Who's him? The Word. Who is he? God created everything through him and nothing, there's no exceptions in creation. Well, somebody else made that. Uh -uh. Everything was created through him. The word gave life. What, what gave life? In the beginning there was life, right? The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life was given to things, to people, to animals, and his life did something. It brought light, not darkness, light to everyone. He was creating, I want you to think about something. He was creating with what? The Word. So, the spoken Word. In other words, he didn't need dump trucks and earth movers and to bring stuff in from other galaxies, right? He's creating by speaking, by, by merely saying universe, the universe forms at his command, by saying the sun. He says the sun, the sun, S-U-N, and, and the sun forms in all of its glory, just by speaking it. So he's creating by the word, he's sustaining the creation by the word, and he's giving light to creation by the word, by the word, by the word. Now, now you've got to say, what's the word? It's doing a lot of stuff in John 1. It's being referred to in Hebrews 1. Go to verse 10 in John 1. He came into the very world he created. Now he's a he, and now he's here. And now he's on the place he made. He came into the very world that he created back in the beginning. And the world, what? Didn't recognize him. Who are you? Who are you? Oh, I'm the creator. I'm the way and the truth and the life. And what do they say? 
pick up stones to stone him because you couldn't possibly be the creator because you look like one of us. Verse 14. So the word became human. The word that created, that sustains, that gives light to the world became a person and made his home among us. Where? On planet Earth. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we've seen his glory. He's a person you can look at. He's not hiding in the shadows. We've seen his glory, the glory of the fathers. Here we go, now there are two. The glory of the fathers, one and only son. We've seen him. Jesus told his apostles that if they've seen him, they've seen the father, and that he and the father are the same person. And, and some people can't, can't grasp it. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why do you ask to see the Father? Because if you've met me, if you've seen me, you've seen him. Jesus radiates the glory of the Father and is far greater than the angels in heaven. That's where Hebrews is trying to set up. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. Colossians, there's a verse in Colossians, verse one, chapter 1. For God had all his fullness, God in all his fullness was pleased to live inside of Christ. So I want you to think about something. When God sent the Holy Spirit to put his holy seed inside the womb of Mary. Everybody listen. When God sends his Holy Spirit upon a woman, a woman, a natural woman, he places his seed inside of her. She had never had sex. He places himself, his seed, inside of this woman. And I want you to read Colossians 1.19. God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. God placed himself as a seed inside the womb of of a woman and the birth of that child was the fullness of God inside human flesh now our mind how, how can the one that can speak the universe put himself in a seed in a woman it's because he can create the universe do you think he's got limitations? Yeah, God, I believe you can create the universe, but I don't think you can become a seed in a woman. I think that's out of bounds. Yeah, I think you made the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe, everything that is, but you can't become a seed in a woman. If he can do all that, don't you think he can place his seed inside of a woman? Jesus cannot be compared to the prophets in the Old Testament. Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah. No, he's greater. He cannot be compared to angels. He's greater. His only comparison, listen, his only comparison is the Father. All of that to get back to first verse. In the past, in Hebrews 1, verse 1, it says, In the past, God spoke to mankind in many ways and in many forms. Give me some examples. Moses, what did he get? He didn't get a text message, did he? He got what? A burning bush. Sometimes God used donkeys, right? A donkey can talk. So if you're thinking, well, I don't know, God can, he doesn't have any limitations. In the past, he used burning bushes and clouds of fire, and he used angels. Angels just showed up and said, hey, I got a message. But what's Hebrews say? L listen, this is really big. He's not going to do it like that anymore. But in these last days, he's going to do it different. In these last days, he will speak through his son. Something changed. That's why you must understand this. In fact, if you don't understand this, I don't know how you're ever going to understand much. Jesus is the Word. The Bible that we hold, that 66 books, is the Word of God. It is alive. It is alive. How? I don't know. I don't know. I know this. There's no other book I read that when I read it, it does something on the inside of me. 
But when I read it, it does something. It's alive. Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Creating, sustaining, bringing light. He's still doing it right now through the Word. He's still doing it tonight. We're studying Jesus by studying the Word. That's how it works. So if you're one of these, and, and I'm going to tell you, I encounter a lot of them say, I believe in Jesus, I just don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't know what to tell you. You're blind. Because the next thing I'm going to say to you is, how did you even know about Jesus? Excuse me. Well, I read it in that book. I thought you didn't believe that book. Well, I believe that part of the book. Because if it weren't up for that book, who's Jesus? Who is he? Who told you about him? How would you even know that he was here, what he did? The Holy Spirit reveals the word. And the Word reveals Jesus, and Jesus reveals God the Father. And I'm going to say it again. When I read the Word, I cannot understand it truly until the Holy Spirit opens my mind. So the Holy Spirit, which by the way, if you're not already confused, who is also God, because let me prove it to you. The Bible says that what came upon Mary to make Mary pregnant? The Holy Spirit. But we don't call Jesus the Son of the Holy Spirit, do we? So what do we do? We, we don't have any trouble acknowledging that the Holy Spirit is God because we don't call Jesus the Son of the Holy Spirit, even though the Bible clearly states that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. So we, we acknowledge that the Holy Spirit and God are the same. Well, the Holy Spirit, who happens to also be God in the Spirit, reveals the Word, which is Jesus, when we open the word and to understand in fact let me just read it uh, john 17 1 after saying all these things jesus looked up to heaven and he's talking to his father the hour has come glorify your son so you can give glory back to you for you have given him authority over everyone jesus in the flesh is is, is acknowledging god has given everything to this man jesus you have given authority over everyone he gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way of eternal life. I've always, in my Bible, I've always marked, this is the foundation of our faith. What? The next verse, verse 3. And this is the way to eternal life. People aren't going to be able to get to the end of the road, meet God, and say, I didn't know, because here it is. This is the way to have eternal life. What? What? It's, here we go. This is it. Who doesn't want eternal life? This is the way to have eternal life, to know the only true God, to know him. Not to know about him, uh -uh -uh, that's not it. To know him and, the son, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to the earth. So how do I get to know God? I'm going to sum it up. To know God, I got to know Jesus. So how do I get to know Jesus? To know Jesus, I got to know the Bible. So how do I get to know the Bible? The Holy Spirit reveals the Word. The Word reveals Jesus, and Jesus reveals the Father. And when I have that i have received eternal life because i didn't just know about it i received it as truth it's eternal life that's it that's it that's eternal life to know god the father and the son that he sent but i have to have the word and the spirit to make that happen this is not jesus is not a promoted angel he is god with skin on him he's god with wrapped in human skin he is the only way to reach the father or hear from the father in these last days hebrew says that in the last days he'll only reveal himself through the son not through angels now, now if jesus wants to use an angel fine but it'll be through Jesus using an angel. If he wants to use a circumstance or something, it'll be because Jesus is doing it in these last days. Why? Because all power, dominion, and authority has already been given to him. Anything that is truly from God in these last days will come through Jesus and only through Jesus. All right, let's go to verse 5, Hebrews 1. God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus. What did he say? You are my son. He never said that to any angel. Today I have become your father. 
He never said that to any angel. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he brought his firstborn son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. So he's not only is he not an angel, the angels have to worship him. Verse 7, regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like winds, his servants like flames of fire. Wind and fire, what's that sound like? Power of the Holy Spirit. Do you want a mind-boggling theological truth? Because here's what I'm going to give you. If you want a moment where, poof, here it comes. This is when Hebrew do, Hebrews does to me. Jesus was the Son of God before the foundation of the earth. I'm going to say it slowly. When most of us think about Jesus being the Son of God, when, when Hebrews says, what well, you are my son, today I become your father. You know what we think? We think baby born in Bethlehem, right? And, and it's true, but that's not when it started. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, 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 no. Jesus was the son of God before the foundation of the earth, before the creation of the earth. The sun event, you are now my son. The sun event began before Bethlehem. Stay with me. The son of God was creating in Genesis chapter 1, right? The son of God was creating everything in Genesis chapter 1. That's 4,000 years before he's born in the flesh in Bethlehem. He's not the son of God in Bethlehem, and he's somebody else in Genesis 1. But there was a day. I don't know when that day is. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's beyond my imagination to even comprehend it. There was a day that God said, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And, and the only thing I can do is make this feeble attempt to describe what I visually think happened. God in all his fullness. God's not a man. God the father is not a man. He is, he is unapproachable light. That's how he's described. He is unapproachable light, energy, power. He became a man through Christ, but in himself he is not a man. We are created in his image and his likeness, but he himself is not a man. So God, in all his fullness and all his glory, takes part of himself. And places it in a separate form called his son. I, I don't even have an idea how that's even possible or reasonable. But they are the same, but now they are different. He never did that to any angel. But for some reason, I'll ask him one day, you can too, for some reason he takes himself and says, today you will become my son. Today you will become part of me. You will become external to me, but you are also already part of me. And that's, that's not Bethlehem. That's, this, is, this is way before the creation of the earth. I don't know how that works. I don't have a clue how that works. He is the only begotten. So that's singular, right? He didn't do that. God didn't do that a bunch of times. He's got a bunch of them. He is the only begotten. He is, he, he is um, the King James and the New American Standard translate the word to bear, to bring forth. God ha bore an only begotten. How? I don't know. He brought forth an only begotten. He didn't bring forth an only begotten just in Bethlehem in a manger. He did this before the creation of the world. John 3 and 1 John 4 both refer to Jesus as the only begotten and the one and only. So whatever happened, it only happened once. So in a crazy, my mind cannot comprehend way, Jesus in Bethlehem is born again. Why? Because he's already become the only begotten son before the creation of the world. And now in Bethlehem, he's born again, this time in human flesh. Wow. Now go back to verse 8, now that everyone is confused. But to the Son, 
God the Father says, your throne, O God. Did, you, did, did God the Father just call Jesus the Son God? Yeah, he did, just then. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. Why would God the Father call his Son God? Unless they're the same. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O oh God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else. He also says to the Son, the Father also says to the Son, in the beginning, here we go, we're back before creation. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and you made the heavens with your hand. Who's doing that? The Son is doing it for the Father before the creation of the earth. Verse 11. <coughs> they will perish. What? Creation. They will perish, but you, my son, will remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing, but you, my son, will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing, but you, my son, are always the same. You will live forever. You, the man, Jesus, will live forever. The Father calls the Son God. The Father says, Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. Whoever this Hebrew writer is, he has been fully briefed by the Holy Spirit and is able to know what we just read. He knows it. The Word became flesh in Bethlehem, but the Word did not begin in Bethlehem. He is referred to as the Ancient of Days. The Word, the Lord, laid the foundations of the earth and made the heavens with His own hands. This is Jesus, the one we sing songs about in worship. That's Him. The Son will one day fold up the heavens like a garment and present them to the Father. Now that picture just blows my mind. One day, all of this vast universe will be folded up by this man, Jesus, in a package and handed over to the Father. That's what it just said. And God the Father placed all of that, all of creation, all of himself inside of Mary's womb. All the future, all of everything, God wrapped in a package and said, here it is on the earth that's why jesus more than any other title for himself calls himself what the son of man because he is born of a woman verse 13 and god never said to any of the angels sit at the place of honor at my right hand until i humble your enemies now here's where it gets interesting there's enemies there's enemies God never said to any angel, here, sit at my right side until all the enemies, who are they? Until all the enemies are made a footstool under your feet. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. The Father has placed the Son at His right hand in power and authority over everything. So I'm going to tell you, right now, today, all power, dominion, and authority belongs to Jesus. It's all His. The only question is, when's he going to grab it? There's a temporary false king on our planet. His name is Satan. He is reigning in the dominion of darkness, but one day he will be snatched out of his power. There's an enemy. And they will eventually find themselves under the feet of Jesus. Now here's a picture. I'm going to make a point of this. Here's a picture that most people, even in the church, cannot see Jesus from these lenses. That when Jesus comes in the second coming, when he comes, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He's coming to kill people. How many church people cannot say that out loud? I'm going to tell you, he's coming to kill people. When he comes, his feet to stand on the Mount of Olives, he's going to walk through the, the Kidron Valley into the Eastern Gate. He's going to sit on David's throne and he's going to reign with an iron rod injustice and he will come to, with a sword to strike down the nations he's coming to kill people he's going to kill those people who have refused to bow to him as king that's what the bible says you know the first time he came as a suffering servant he's not going to be a suffering servant the next time 
He's, going to, he's the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And all those who are not saved, who are alive when He comes, will die. They will die. They will die. He will, he will destroy them. How many church people don't want to hear that? But it's quite clear. In fact, notice this. Sit at the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, until they become under your feet. Who are the people under his feet? Well, that's somebody. That's, that's not real people. Yeah, it is real people. Yeah, it is. Angels are there to serve the Son and to serve humans. So I don't know what you think about angels. But angels, this tells me that angels have a role to serve under the authority of Christ and they are servants of people. They're here for us. Those who will inherit salvation through the Son of God. I want to go back to the first two verses of chapter 1 again. Long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, He has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. First, final days, last days. There cannot be final days unless there's a final day. Right? Doesn't make any sense. So I want to tell you, when the Hebrew writer under the Holy Spirit wrote this, the countdown had begun. You live in the countdown. How much longer? I don't know. We're in the countdown. These are the last days. Do you know what happens on the final day? Remember, I'm going to tell you, this is a prophetic book. He will come to judge the world, to render justice, to separate the sheep from the goats. God promised everything to Jesus as an inheritance. Now, here's where it gets interesting and personal. God, I, I just read it to you, promised everything to Jesus as an inheritance. He's the only begotten, God the Father, everything belongs to the Son, right? It's an inheritance, it's His, everything. Everything. That day hasn't happened yet, but it will happen on the last day. What? An inheritance is going to transfer. I want to focus on the inheritance that will be, re be revealed through Christ on the last day. On the last day. This is big because those who are in Christ are going to share in His inheritance on the last day. I, I got to go over to the book of Ephesians for Paul to reveal what that means. Paul writes this, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he, Jesus, has given to those he called. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. God has given us to the Son. Everybody in the room today, if you're in Christ, God has given you to the Son. He has connected you to the Son. And by connecting you to the Son, he has connected you to the inheritance of of the Son. Stay with me. Verse 19. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now He, Jesus, is far above any ruler, any authority, any power, any leader, or everything, anything else. Not only in this world, where? Anywhere in the heavenly realms, the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ, and he has made him head over all things for the benefit of what? For the benefit of what? The church. This is God's plan before the foundations of the earth, for the benefit of the church. What's the benefit of the church? The church is the body of Christ. The church has, are a people who are connected to Jesus. And by connecting to Jesus, you are connecting to his inheritance. Here we go. And the church, verse 23, is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere. How? With himself. The church is the body of Christ. The Spirit of Christ lives inside of us in this room. Jesus is the body of God the Father. Listen carefully. He is the human body of God the Father. God the Father 
Do anybody doubt this? God the Father lives inside of Jesus the man. God placed his fullness inside the Son, and they, what happened? What happened when God placed his fullness inside of the Son? They became one. One, the same. They became one. Jesus has the Spirit without limit. In fact, I wonder how many times people have read over that in the Gospel of John. Jesus, nobody else got the Spirit without limit. A lot of people got the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist got the Spirit when he was in his mother's womb. But nobody got the Spirit without limit. Who gets the Spirit without limit? God. Without limit means without limit. To infinity and beyond. Right? It's got no end. Who has that? Jesus has placed his Spirit inside of us so that we can become one with him. We didn't get the spirit without limit, but he has the spirit without limit. And he placed his spirit inside of us when we were born again of the water and born of the spirit. This is how John the Baptist explains Jesus. John 3, 31. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He, Jesus, testifies about what he's seen and heard. Why? He can talk about heaven stuff because he's from heaven. But how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true, and he's sent, for he's, he is sent by God. This man, Jesus, John the Baptist said, this man standing here, right here, he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the Spirit without limit. The Father loves his Son and has put everything without limit inside of him, into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. And anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains what? If, is there a third category? Anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life. It's called faith. But anyone who does not have faith in the Son, what? Still, they remain under God's angry judgment. And when He comes, when Jesus comes, they will be under the angry judgment. It's called the second death. This is why you must understand the work of the Holy Spirit in the church age. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what? I'm going to make it really simple. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is Christ in me. It is Christ in you. So is Christ in you? Can you just get a little bit of that? Reigning in power and authority. The power of God is revealed through the Son. And the Spirit of Christ dwells in believers in power. And yes, there is an inheritance that will be revealed on the last day. In fact, I've got to tell you about the inheritance, because I'm going to tell you, the inheritance will keep you in the race. Yeah, it will. I've known people that the inheritance made them nice to that uncle who they didn't even like. <laughs> the inheritance will keep you in the race. It will. Because I'm going to tell you what the inheritance looks like. Romans 8, 12. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Why? Because the sinful nature has been brought under the authority of the Holy Spirit. I'm not obligated to my old nature. For if you live by the dictates of the, of the sinful nature, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are what? Don't read over it. All who are led by the Spirit. The Spirit has dominion over my flesh, over my nature. They are what? They are the children of God. They can look at God and say, Daddy. Daddy. They are the children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit. When He adopted you as His own children, and now we can call Him Abba, Father. Some translate that daddy. For his spirit joins with our spirit. Here we go. I want you to notice his spirit joins with our spirit and affirms that we are God's children. Now, are we two or are we one? When his spirit joins with my spirit, are we still two? Uh, we are now one. 
we are one. And since, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, here we go, here we go. This is why I read this. And since we are his children, since I'm connected, we are his heirs. I just got goosebumps that jumped up three high just then. What? I am an heir, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. He is my, God is my father. We got the same daddy. He is my father. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, uh-oh, you got to be willing to share in his suffering. The enemy will soon be crushed under the feet of Jesus. I can tell you, I read the story. The enemy will soon be crushed under the feet of Jesus. The last enemy is what? Death. And notice how Paul describes the final event that will take place. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, that's Adam, right? Death came into the world through a man. Now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Who's he? Say his name. Jesus. Say his name. Jesus. Death came through Adam. Life comes through Jesus. Through the second Adam. Verse 22. Just as everyone dies, because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the first of a great harvest of souls for God the Father. The first Adam came from God. He had no earthly father, right? You ever hear anybody ask the silly question, did Adam have a belly button? Huh? I don't know why he would. You know what? I remember my daughter asked me that when she was little. Did Adam have a belly button? I don't think so. I don't know what it would be there for. So he's unique, right? Because he's got no father. His father is God himself. The first Adam came from God. He has no earthly father. Death came through the first Adam, the man that was born of God. Adam was born of God, right? He didn't get here on his own. He's not by the will of two parents. He was born of God. But the Bible says clearly there's a last Adam. And this last Adam is man's last chance for life. This is it. You miss this one, you're going to miss life. The last Adam paid the penalty for the sin of the first Adam. Cursed on a tree. In fact, there's a parallel there. That's one of those, here's one of those. The first Adam, it was a tree that brought him death. The last Adam, it was a tree that brought us life. The first Adam, the tree, was the curse. Don't eat of the tree. The curse is what? Death. But death on the tree of the last Adam has set us free. God's got this plan. It didn't happen in Bethlehem. It happened before the foundations of the earth. Christ was the first of this soul harvest for God the Father. But there is an order. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But there's an order. There's an order. God's got an order. None of this is random. There's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. And then all who belong to Christ will be raised when? When do you get raised? When he comes back. The loud shout, voice of the archangel, trumpet call, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and those who remain on the earth shall rise to meet him in the air when he comes back. And the trumpet, right? Verse 24. After that, after that resurrection, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom, Jesus, the Son, will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler, having, having destroyed. He killed them. Do you understand that? He killed them having destroyed every ruler, every authority, and every power. That, that refers to those who would, would not bow to him. For Christ must reign. He's king. It's all his. He must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. 
And the last enemy, what's the last close of the book, the last enemy, before he turns everything over to God the Father? And the last enemy is what? Death. And when he does that, when he does it, listen, when he does that, nothing again will ever die. Forever. Death is vanquished. The last enemy has been defeated. Death itself. We're going to go into a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven, the first earth are going to pass away. And there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the Jerusalem, coming down as a bride. Do you think there's any death there? There's no death there. No crying. No death. No separation. He's vanquished it. He defeated it. Verse 27, for the scriptures say, God has put all things under his authority. Of course, here we go. Here's the separation now. God the Father put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things under his authority, that does not include God himself. He does not go above the Father who gave Christ his authority. Then when all things are under his authority, here we go. Here's the end of the story. When all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority. Whoa. He will, he will then submit himself under the authority of the Father and say, finished. All you gave me to do is complete. Sin, death have been vanquished. I'm going to read it again, verse 28. Then when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority so that God who gave his Son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. Okay, you, you want another one? Here, here, here comes one. Here it comes. The Bible says in the, in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be two thrones. Read the book of Revelation. The Father and the Son will both be there uniquely separate. Both of them. Only on the new heaven and the new earth. After the millennial reign of Christ, after death has been vanquished, after death is canceled, after Jesus hands everything over to the Father, submits himself to the Father, new heaven, new earth, and it says that the Father and the Son both will dwell independently upon the new earth, which is called then heaven. You might want to miss that. I don't want to miss that. So let me close quickly. If God placed his glorious spirit without limit inside his son Jesus, and Jesus became the only begotten, and if Jesus has placed his glorious spirit inside of me and inside of you, we too, we too, it is that spirit that has made us God's children. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. It is that spirit in me that has made me, made you a child of God. Jesus has become our brother. He's my brother. And because we belong to Jesus, we are now the children of God. If we got the same daddy, we got to be brothers. All right? Luke 20, verse 34, Jesus replied, Marriage is for people here on earth. But in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they will never die again. In this respect, they'll be like the angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. Children of God and children of the resurrection. John 1.10, he came into the very world he created. But the world didn't recognize him, and he came to his own people, the Jewish people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him, I hope that's everybody in this room tonight, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he did something supernatural that you cannot do for yourself. He gave you the right to become the children of God. They are reborn, not of a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us and he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness and we have seen his glory the glory of the father's one and only son that's the good news that's the good news you know the gospel means good news that's the good news but i'd be wrong if i didn't tell you the bad news there's another father all of that belongs if god's your father jesus is your brother god this god's your father but there's another father 
We are all children of one of these two fathers, God or Satan. How do I know? I didn't make it up. Jesus told us. Jesus reveals the truth of the two fathers to the religious Jews who refuse to believe that he was who he says he was. So I'll read that and we'll close. John 8, 39. Our father is Abraham, the Jews told Jesus. They declared, no, no. No, your father's not Abraham, Jesus replied. If you were really the children of Abraham, and I'm going to tell you what, I'll give you a hint. The children of Abraham will be called the children of God. If you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you're trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitating your real father, they replied. We aren't illegitimate children. God himself is our father. Then Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I have come to you from God, and I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father. Here it comes. You are the children of your father, the devil. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I, Jesus, tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? And here it comes, verse 47. And anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. I want to tell you what, if you're struggling with the Bible, you're struggling with something bigger than a book. And anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. Finally, can you see the powerful love of God that has offered us this great gift? 1 John 3, 1. See how very much the Father has loved us? How would he display his love? For he calls us his children. Wow. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we're God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already, I like this part, that's why I chose it. The, the, we're already God's children. I'm not waiting one day to be God's child. I'm his child right now. He's my father. He's got this thing. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I know what? He's got this. We are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we, he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. What would it be like to be his child when Jesus comes back? He's not yet shown us fully what that's going to be like, but we do know this. We will be like him. For we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure. For he is pure. That's Hebrews chapter 1. And a whole lot of stuff going around it. I'm going to pray. Father, thank you for this marvelous book that reveals that Jesus is far superior to the angels and the prophets. And in the past, you revealed your glory through a lot of ways and a lot of means. But in these last days, there is one way, the sun. For in the sun, all the radiance of your glory has been displayed. And those who receive the sun will receive you, the Father, and be a part of the glorious inheritance you plan for your children. And we are thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.